Our guests today know the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange very well. From Rosenblatt Securities, Vikas Shah, Managing Director of Investment Banking, and Dushat Sharawat, Director of Strategic Insights and Fintech Investment Banking. Gentlemen, thanks for coming back. It's awesome to have you here as always. Uh, maybe, Vikas, if we can uh, jump in with you first. Uh, tell us about the major trends that you're seeing over at Rosenblatt. What's happening these days? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having us. Um, so 2018 and 2019, if you compare those two years, actually, you know what, 2019 has not has been a, a very good year overall, although not exactly in the in sync with 2018 in terms of where the numbers came out, but nonetheless a very, very solid year of performance th um, across FinTechs. And we'd love to kind of share some of those things, uh, the metrics that we track. We track those uh, metrics across three different um, matrices. The first one is literally looking around the amount of fintech capital that got raised. Uh, 2019 saw, uh, we expect 2019 to end with about 40 billion of uh, total fintech capital being raised. That compared to 48 billion uh, of capital that was raised in 2018. While this is technically a drop, but uh, there was a one mega deal in financial in 2018 that was $14 billion deal. So if you take that out as a one-off deal, then 2019 is actually a 20 plus percent uh, increase over 2018. So a pretty solid, powerful year. Uh, on the M&A front, um, 2018 saw in the number of deals, it actually saw a decline, roughly middle over 500 deals as opposed to north of 700 deals in 2018. But the uh, quantum of capital that was put to work in terms of acquiring companies was much, much higher. We are talking about a quarter of a trillion dollars, $253 billion worth of M&A uh, compared to $110 billion worth of M&A. A uh, large part of that M&A actually came from a few big blockbuster deals. We've followed in our space, um, the deal that was announced recently was uh, LSE acquiring Refinitiv, and that was a $27 billion deal. In the payment space, there were about three large deals, uh, Pfizer acquiring First Data, uh, FIS acquiring WorldPay, and Global Payments acquiring Thesis, and those deals were roughly $80 billion. And we saw one very interesting deal in the insure tech space, which was Assurance, a company called Assurance, which was a private um, insure tech company, was acquired by Prudential for three and a half billion dollars. So if you take the trends overall, very robust numbers um, in terms of both the number of deals as well as um, the quantum of capital that was put to work. Apart from funding and M&A, as Vikas was talking about, I mean, third leg of the stool in the in the market, obviously, the IPO calendar, right? With New York Stock Exchange, you can't not talk about companies going public. So last year, there were about 15 fintech IPOs. This year, there were 10 in the US. And of those 10, uh, three were kind of healthcare payments. The biggest one this year was TradeWeb, you know, blockbuster IPO, uh, stocks doing pretty well. We actually put a spit in the secondary uh, offering. Um, the IPO calendar has been, you know, looking pretty good. But I will say that uh, there seems to be some trepidation going into next year because one of the lessons we've learned from 2019 is that you know, top line numbers matter, but you know, profitability and EBITDA matters a tremendous amount too, and lessons we learned 20 years ago. So I think going into next year, uh, we have a lot of FinTech unicorns that are in the wings, you know, primed for going public, but um, we'll you know, watch and see what actually happens, because obviously it depends upon how the public markets overall are performing. But there's a stable of very successful, good, solid, um, IPO candidates in the fintech market and looking forward to 2020 being a good year from a public market side as well. I think we're all hoping, including all of our friends down on the floor here, for another robust year of IPOs. Uh, let's shift gears. So you're changing your role a little bit, uh, moving from being interviewed to interviewing uh, Congressman uh, Mark Roberts from Utah uh, coming up, and you're going to be talking about uh, sandboxes and what's going on in the state of Utah and others. Uh, share this. I, I happen to love the concept of uh, sandboxes, whether that's within the regulators themselves or dedicated states. So I know you've been diving deep into that. Do you, could you share with us on that? Absolutely, Vince. Happy to do that. Yes. Yeah, so this afternoon, we have the honor of uh, moderating a session with Mark Roberts, who's uh, the congressman from the 57th district of Utah. And uh, Utah this year became the third state in the U.S. after Arizona and Wyoming 
to have created a regulatory sandbox for fintech companies. And regulatory sandbox basically is, think of it as a regulatory carve out, uh, a special set of um, regulatory measures that enable fintech companies to actually do their, do their thing, you know, help them sort of grow. And we saw Arizona introduce that in 2018, Wyoming did that in the summer this year, and Utah's third state. The overall objective of these states essentially is to compete with each other to attract you know, very interesting fintech companies to these states, hopefully being an engine for growth, for value creation, for employment. And uh, you know, Mark Roberts has done a tremendous job at Utah sort of pioneering this. Uh, just for a second, looking at it at a national level, uh, the Singapore Fintech Festival is happening this year. And Singapore has put itself on the world map because they created a regulatory sandbox five years ago, sponsored by the Singapore Monetary Authority. And today it attracts about 200 fintech companies that they incubate. They fund and actually run those companies partially as well. And they're attracting 45,000 people. So this is not just a state by state or within a country, states competing with each other. It's basically a, a land grab in the fintech space for where capital and interesting ideas and technology be attracted. And this is an international thing about sort of com countries competing with each other. So yeah. uh, puts kind of the context on, on what's happening broadly in the fintech space, the international level, and obviously what states like Utah are doing. Yeah, so we're talking, I'm sorry. No, so I'll, one thing I wanted to add was, uh, the regulators have really coming, been coming around. Instead of becoming bottlenecks, and uh, really compliance and governance, while that is still an important function, I think they are also becoming enablers. They realize that you need to uh, create, uh, take the friction out and create a smooth um, uh, regulatory framework for companies to really come to your state and really enable innovation. And that's what, the, what is going to make them competitive going forward. It's all about innovation, job creation, and you kind of uh, anticipated some of my question when we look at, look, you have Lab CFTC being very innovative. We have the Office of Innovation with FINRA now. We have yeah. FinHub at the SEC. So maybe, maybe certainly a couple of years in many instances behind what happened in Singapore. But now, how do you see the states and the regulators? Are they going to work together on this? Uh, are they going to be separate and distinct uh, sandboxes? Yeah, I think, uh the, the first thing actually to note is that, in fact, in Utah's case, um, fintech happens to be the first industry that the different states are trying out a sandbox in, but actually Utah's vision is actually to expand the idea of a regulatory sandbox cross industry. So basically, you know, position Utah as a state that's open for business and particularly innovative companies across different industries. Obviously, there is an interplay between federal you know, issues and state regulations, and uh, that's why the states have actually focused on areas like payments, for example, which is very much of states have some control over it rather than uh, if you talk about sort of you know, moving money around or remittances or things like that that require more of a you know, federal charter. Um, so all of that, I think, still needs to be worked at. But the Arizona, Wyoming, and Utah sandboxes is somewhat more contained and focused really around a couple of parts of financial services. So I think, you know, this is first innings in terms of uh, the state's efforts in different countries that are going down this path of creating the regulatory sandbox. Uh, but we'll sort of, I think it's a very positive move and business absolutely welcomes, you know, regulatory. We need easier and, you know, uh, a more encouraging environment for fintech companies to actually operate and grow. Couldn't agree with that more. Uh, we have one minute left. I, uh, maybe you can give me a quick recap. You recently were at uh, Money 2020. What are your observations? What did you see? What was the sense coming out of there? Yeah, absolutely. So Money 2020 happens in Vegas every year. There are about 11,000 people that come to talk about the future of financial services. It used to be that the conference was all about payments, but today it's actually talking about wealth management, capital markets, insurance as well. Uh, two big ideas that are coming out of that conference. The first one was that a third of the attendees at Money 2020 were non-financial companies. Now, what are Caterpillar and Dunkin' Donuts and General Motors doing at a payments conference? They are there to understand how the payments environment or new forms of payment are going to enable new forms of commerce to happen. So the first thing was that what we think about a financial services issue, payments, for example, actually is the vehicle that is going to deliver next generation business models. So you can argue that ride sharing Uber and Lyft may not have been possible if it wasn't for a frictionless, convenient, cost-effective way of payments embedding in the ride-sharing experience. So that's our point number one. Uh, related to that was that uh, there were a number of non-financial companies that were the most well-attended sessions. For example, um, Peter Hazelhurt, the, who heads Uber Money, has 250 people that work for him in Uber Money. That was the most attended session at Money 2020. 
And what Uber Money is trying to do basically is take the 3.1 million drivers and offer them credit cards and lending and investment products and retirement products, all offered by Uber Money, right? Apple, you've seen the Apple card this year. You've got Amazon offering all kinds of services. So if you thought that non-financial services companies are not encroaching in our space, we probably need to think again. Those are the two major sort of findings from Money 2020. Great takeaways. Guys, as always, great to have you both here and look forward to having you come back again and uh, sharing some more wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Vince. Okay.